You're listening to the Real Estate Runway Podcast, powered by Quattro Capital, where we are all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, the recovering engineer turned multifamily investor, Chad Sutton. All right, Real Estate Runway family, today we have a lender edition. So I'm bringing MBFS on the show today, a gentleman by the name of Mark Ritter, who's the CEO of this credit union cooperative. We're going to talk a lot about credit unions versus banks and how credit union financing can actually be a smarter way to go just with flexibility of structure and more basis on relationship. And surprisingly, they're actually, they're very much more out there right now, given the lender, the lending market that we're in today. So let's get into the episode before we do whatever modality you're listening to this on, just scroll down, like it, subscribe share the show with a buddy or two, pay it forward, okay? We create all this stuff, not for profit, but for you. And so anyone who you think can get something out of the show, likes, subscribes, comments, all that kind of stuff are what do it. So just interact with the show wherever you are. If you're on TikTok, swipe, or I don't know what you do on TikTok, swipe, things of that sort. So without further ado, let's get right into the show. Here we go. All right, all right, all right. Real Estate Runway family, welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. Special edition today, we have a lender edition with us. So we're going to talk with Mark Ritter, CEO of MBFS. This is a credit union. Mark, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me. You know, as we always do on these shows, before we get into it, give us a little bit of your history. How did you go from the person you once were to the person that you are today running MBFS and why the banking industry Let's go into you a little bit before we get into the meat of today's show. Sure. My, my origin story is I was a, I'm a Pennsylvania native and went to Penn State and right after college packed up and moved to Nashville, Tennessee, because I loved country music. I love the area. The Oilers were moving there at the time. And then I was working for a company there that moved me back to, back to Pennsylvania and I was involved in the banking space, commercial banking space. And then when I was looking for that next chapter of life, I really am more of a small town guy that likes the community banking space and discovered credit unions over 20 years ago. And ever since then, I've only been involved in one piece of the credit union space. And that is offering commercial financing which is mainly real estate investments through credit unions. And I was at a credit union for 10 years. And then 11 years ago, I became the CEO of a company that's not uh, known as a CUSO in our space, which stands for Credit Union Service Organization. And we're a company that's owned by 13 credit unions. And we deal with credit unions nationwide helping out their members and helping out the credit union put together commercial real estate and residential real estate investment financing. Well, so let's talk about that a little bit. And I think you're the perfect person to go down this road with me. A lot of us out there, honestly, partially including me, don't really understand the difference in credit unions and the general regulated banking system. So how do you lump those two into different boxes? How are the rules different? If we could unpack that for a moment with your expertise, that would be wonderful. Sure. And I'm somebody, not like many of my credit union friends, when you drive past a credit union that has drive throughs it has ATMs, it has auto loans, checking accounts, credit cards, all those things, and they spend just like at a commercial bank. And, and really the difference of what a credit union is when you un uncover that onion and the layers of it, it all goes into the corporate structure and the philosophy behind it. And what a credit union is a not-for-profit financial cooperative. It's actually owned and operated by the members, managed by and overseen by board of directors that's elected by the membership for the benefit of the membership. So at a credit union, we're not looking to grow it so we can sell it out and flip it to some larger credit union. It's really a, a member-driven organization. And, and what is that philosophy permeate through? Because usually they like to return some of that value by providing good service. Nobody's out there on the street 
protesting against their local credit unions were usually perceived as pretty friendly organizations. And, and, and also the fee structure tends to be a little friendlier. And, and the interest rates that we can pay uh, in, on savings and charge in interest, we try to be competitive. We're a regulated institution. We have costs. We have capital requirements. The insurance is identical to the banking insurance. A lot of people don't realize that. When you say insurance, you're meaning like FDIC type insurance? Or exactly. Or, okay. Yep. Yeah. FDIC insurance. We have what's the NCUA has an insurance fund, which is our regulator, and it's backed by that same federal government. We can have a debate on whether that's worth anything or not if we keep printing money. A rabbit that's hole a, for another day. <laughs> that's another conversation. But yeah, that that's really the difference in, in a credit union. And, and historically... Institute credit unions were consumer organizations. And it's real. You joined there because it was a teacher's credit union or some local factory or government or military base. And, and really, when I got into the credit union space, uh, I, I was a joke among my local bankers. They were just like, what the heck is a credit union doing this? And now the industry has just continues to grow and grow every year. And I like to come on shows like yours to just to spread the word and get people to consider a credit union. And, and this is a great place to do that. And I think that, like, folks, I'm excited to have Mark on the show because I, I also have been exploring credit unions. And it's not that I haven't used them before, but it's that I, I just I hadn't really been looking at them. Because in the past, when everything was 3 4% debt or cheaper, right, it, it made sense to use agency or, or local banks or things like that. But I'd never really had the opportunity to explore the financing the credit unions offer. And since I've been doing that, I've been grossly surprised, like in an amazing way, of what the terms and, and structures can be. And they're a lot more flexible than you'd imagine. So so let's I want to get into that. But Mark, let, let me pose two questions, because I think they may intertwine. And perhaps we hit one after the other, or perhaps they intertwine. The first is, from your perspective, you know, we're in an environment, we're recording this in September 2023. We've endured over 18 months of inflation and interest raise and, and they fetter or quantitative tightening and things of that sort. And so from your perspective, where is the commercial real estate and single family, if it makes sense, where is the real estate lending market today and where are we going? And then the second part of that, and I don't know if these are phase one, phase two, or one answer, but let's talk about the credit union product and how it is actually a very viable solution today and, and how it may be a, a good choice for our borrowers today. We do have a lot of operators that listen to this show, so this is really good meat for everybody. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll tackle the first one uh, with, with regards to where the market's at today. And what we're really seeing, we see a lot of deals from all over the country from coming in through different credit unions every day. And the cash flow is undoubtedly tightening. When, you're, when you had your deal at three and a quarter percent versus seven and a quarter percent, and you haven't been had a chance to move the move your markets and rents as much as quickly as that, the Fed tends to move a lot quicker than lease terms. That that's really impacting what you can see there. Now the other side of that is we're also seeing what I'll call a return to a little bit of historical norms in that when deals were 3%, you were making, you could have a chance to make a lot of money and the, the real estate market was tight. And, and you were probably making a little bit more than the historical averages. And, I, and I'm somebody that tends to believe at the end of the day, we always regress to the mean and the averages. Yeah. So, so values are there, demand is there. I believe this country has an inherent lack of housing. And you're in the Nashville metro area. And, Case and in point. You, you just don't walk around with the newspaper saying, I'm going to look at places and pick and choose whatever I want. Sometimes you take what you get. And, and, and we really need to address that as a country to bring more housing units online to level the marketplace. But Mark, the, the funny thing is here in Nashville, 
we recognize a down market when you get 20 offers on a home instead of 40. So fair. <laughs> yes. Now, now, overall, in what I'll, what I'll call the commercial side, we're seeing that very localized and regionalized and certain segments are great and certain segments are really struggling. And for retail, to us, it's all about location, the size of the property. It, it seemed like in the 80s, every small town built their shopping mall that had three anchor tenants and a, and, and a row of inside stores. Those are dead. That Those are really struggling with very few exceptions. But new retail is strong. New retail is strong where the economy is strong. People need to shop. Warehouses are strong. You drive up and down the major interstates and there's a lot of warehouse space there. The piece that I think is really going to take a hit is what I'll call the large office space. That piece, I'm working from my home. And like many other people, they may be listening to this show from their home where they used to go to a cube every day. And maybe the large law firm that took up three or four floors of, of a downtown office building, they may scale that back. Maybe a large single tenant building, they may scale that back. And that piece is going to be a tough challenge because I think you're going to have to really hustle to get more smaller tenants in a property. And there's a lot of choices out there for businesses and corporate uh, tenants. So that piece is what I'm worried most about. Now, what we're seeing too is in what I'll call the small mid-sized cities where the whole remote work isn't as strong. If you're in a city of 50, 100,000 people, the commuting isn't a big deal and they tell you go to work. That's a little more stable and which is very much a difference where you're seeing a little bit of the small mid-sized cities be much more stable than some of the older urban areas that have these large office towers. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it, it, it's curious. I don't know if you're seeing any data to the contrary on this, but it, we can pretend and shoot in the dark at what we think office occupancy will be relative to what it was. I've heard numbers between 60 and 85% thrown out, but it seems that the general consensus is from a product perspective, the like there, and there actually are still mid and high rise office buildings, class A stuff being built today that are very profitable. And, and so that seems to tell you that at least the market thinks, okay, of the office that is out there, the mid to high rise class A stuff is probably going to be where folks aggregate to. And it's going to be some of the older and maybe single story, not always suburban, but some of the older vintage office that winds up being the one that kind of takes that ax on the occupancy. They wind up not being able to fill those. Are you seeing any trends to that regard or this is me being morbidly curious on what you're saying? Yeah, it's really that, like you said, that older space. I was in New Jersey and visited a business partner in New Jersey and it was a single road with about eight to 10 buildings. And these were vintage early 80s office buildings and each building probably had 20 cars in front of it for this huge office building. Those are the places that will probably be imploded one day. Good location, access to, to, to subways and transportation, access to where people live. We're going to be getting back to fundamentals, but this yeah. mass suburban migration uh, of moving to, to driving to the office park in the suburbs, I think is really going to struggle and you're going to see that. What can we retrofit that for? Who, who knows? Some people say we could turn them into apartments. I always try, I think some of this is much more simpler because I always say if people have jobs, everything else tends to fall in line. And I do, I, I also think with the housing issue, we have an, we have an inherent labor, labor issue in this country where you're going to see unemployment remain low no matter what the Fed does. It's really, and if people have jobs and they're working, there's always going to be a certain percentage that, need, that needs somewhere to go. So that's the good piece. When you see 
the unemployment shoot up, that's when I have more concerns. But I don't see that happening just with the lack. I have two, two kids, 21 and 18, and there's a lot fewer in that age group than there were. The, we need more workers in this country along with some housing. Yeah, that's actually interesting because you you almost see conflicting demographics there. Like one, the, the population size may not be as large as it once was as, as baby boomers move through millennials age into middle age, and then you have the younger generation. So at some point, I feel like the housing stock has got to, to catch up to housing formations, but I guess to be determined there. Either way, I'm with you. I think that Look, shelter is a basic need. It's not going anywhere. We can't just say, gee, I don't want to live somewhere anymore. It's not going to be like an office fate where you stop your behavior and you don't need it anymore. It's always going to be there. So I appreciate that. I'd love to, I'd love to jump over to the, the solution that is the credit union financing. And so I'd love to just open the floor up. I've been recently exploring this. I'm so excited you came on the show today to talk more detail about it. And we can feel free to speak to the single family borrower as well as the commercial real estate borrower and what sorts of structures and competitive products may be available. Because I really do think that this is a solution that's a little bit more, not market agnostic, but a little more able to craft the solution than many of the typical agency products and things like that are out there. So let, let's get into that, Mark. Want to generate higher return and drive alpha for your commercial real estate firm? Now you can with Lobby CRE by 30 Capital. Lobby CRE is an asset management platform designed to manage and optimize cash flow for faster returns and more visibility into performance. Shift your strategy with the market, not because of it. Identify opportunities and mitigate risk now rather than later, and save more than eight hours per week through automation. Click the link in the show notes to learn more and book a demo. You know, the first thing that I always say is, yeah, you know, we are a regulated financial institution. So I got to show you, I got to collect the same stuff that everybody else collects. I need personal financial statements. I need rent rolls. If it's big properties, we get into leases and tax returns and all of those types easy. That's the easy part. That's the piece where I'm going to say there's nothing magic about what we do. Yeah. That, that is what it is. We have to show what we have to show. Now, where I think credit unions shine is that we don't take that all of those numbers and just put it in a box, send it to a, an underwriting place and spits out a decision. And I hope your experience plays out where we really think is credit unions like to have that conversation of understanding who you are and, and understanding your transaction, but also understanding where you're going and also understanding how you can fit in the whole cooperative, not just a, as a transaction now, but are, is can the credit union help you out with your entire life? Many credit unions will offer employee benefits and help you out with investments and all of your personal savings and mortgages. And, and that relationship really matters. It's not just putting a product out there. Now, when it comes to the product that we put out there, in today's world, if I was to go to a credit union for one reason today, and one reason only, that it would be no federal credit union can charge a prepayment penalty on a loan that we do for commercial and investment real estate. Now, the last few years, uh, when, when you were getting your loan at 3% or 3.25%, that was the last thing on anybody's mind is to worry about a prepayment penalty because these were historically low rates. We're in a different market. Rates are higher. If your rate begins with a 7, I've even seen up to an 8 there's much more room for error and rates will go down at some point. Don't know when, but they're going to go down. And that credit union structure allows you the flexibility to restructure and modify the loan, pay it off without the big, pay, without the big prepayment that other institutions will go. And that is one of those pieces and a lot of investors, especially if you're newer, you don't realize 
the law does not protect you in any way, shape, or form when it comes to your loan documents. Not on when you get a consumer mortgage or heck an auto loan, even you get reams and reams of disclosures and facts, and this is your loan and this is your loan. You don't get anything like that on a real residential investment real estate loan or a commercial loan because the law says you read that, you understand it, you're a sophisticated person. So those terms and conditions are really important. And the credit union structure allows us to be flexible and friendly that this transaction is fair for you. It's fair in the future and we can modify and adjust it as the market changes. That's really powerful. And so just to clarify that, let's say we have an example where we originate at seven and a half percent today, because that's what, what prime is trending to or whatever the number is. And maybe four years down the road, the same equivalent rate could be 5% or five and a half. So there, there may be, rather than just terminating the loan and going somewhere else, for, which because there's no pre penalty, that's wonderful. But there would probably be appetite or propensity to say, hey, let's look at your cash flows again on this residential or commercial real estate asset. And let's see, okay, maybe we restructure the loan, restructure the amount or restructure the rate to keep it on the books here and provide mutual benefit. Is that kind of the, the thought process? It, it, exactly. And, and one of the, the other pieces in today's market, you know, the, the reason credit unions can do that is because the regulations mandate it. That's one thing. But also, you really have to look at where credit unions get their money. And the other piece is a lot of people don't realize when they get a loan from agencies, from Wall Street, from large banks, that money that it isn't from local deposits, they're borrowing it from somebody else and right. then lending it to you with a markup. And that's really the reason for a lot of these really onerous terms that restrict what you can do because they have bills to pay and they're borrowing that money. So credit unions, for every dollar of deposits, today they're typically lending out about 85 cents in loans. So when, when you're funding a loan with your local deposits, as opposed to borrowed funds, you have a lot more flexibility with what you can do in your portfolio. And, and it's, I think it's really good for the economy when you're putting local deposits to local use with your people. And they're allowing for that lower borrowing base and cost of funds that then maybe having to go out and borrow the money from Wall Street that gets pushed off to you. So that's a very important distinction, Mark. And, and with a typical bank, we've talked a lot about the concept of fractional reserve lending on this show and then how it plays into the whole, the whole environment that is the economic ecosystem. So that's where a, a bank can take $1 in deposits and lend it out virtually 10 different times. And a lot of that money is borrowed, as you mentioned, it's borrowed from depositors. So credit unions are actually, and maybe this is the regulation, credit unions are limited to 85 cents on the dollar of- they're, the they're not limited to that, but which, that's what you yeah. typically see today in the so marketplace. Okay. Yeah. There, there's some people, now, now, now don't get me uh, wrong, credit union, there are some credit unions out there that's having the same liquidity crunch as everybody else. It's not as severe- in, as some of the other sectors because of how they do that. But generally, they're, they're lending out less than a dollar of deposits or a dollar of loans for every dollar of deposits, which really gives them a lot more flexibility it does, over yeah. their balance sheet. That makes now, a lot of sense. I never knew that distinction, so thank you for that. <laughs> Go ahead. Now, a concern of credit unions is because of that structure, Maybe if you look at your credit union, maybe they have two, three branches in a relatively small institution compared to some of the other places. That's where guys like me come into play because we're essentially owned by the credit unions and an aggregator for the credit unions. So we bring the credit unions together so they can lend as an organization many times more than they could individually. One, kind of like a, syndic unions, a syndicate of sorts, right? Exactly. Right. And credit unions as cooperatives have a really strong tradition of cooperating with each other. 
you put a bunch of credit unions have probably have way too many conferences in our industry because we're all friends with each other and talk and share. But if you threw a bunch of local bankers in there, you know, no, every one of those, they don't talk and share about anything. Whereas the credit unions work together and syndicate and participate deals. So you re- when you work with a credit union, you really have the power of the industry behind you as opposed to just that single institution. Yeah, that's super interesting to know. And wow, that's incredible. So going to the structures a little bit, my exposure to credit unions has been, you can, the basic loan to value structures where you're amortizing out of the gate typically are available. And that's more of a single family thing. And I think on commercial real estate, permanent loans where you're going in based on in-place debt coverage and a certain uh, loan to value on appraised value, things of that sort, typically 25 to 30 year AM. And I think I've also seen loan to cost structures where it's maybe we're doing a value add rehabilitation play and, and you would escrow a certain amount of construction funds until work is complete or even ground up construction types. So is there really any limitation to the type of real estate loans that you have an appetite for? In the- no, and that's one of the nice things. We work with about 100 credit unions nationwide. So when, when you talk with one of our lenders, not every single credit is into credit unions into every single type of absolute property. But usually within our network, uh, we have a pretty broad base of credit unions. So that's what's nice. And even we refer to different areas. Maybe you're in Tennessee, but you have a deal in Florida. Instead of going and shopping that, we just simply move you to a credit union partner in Florida Mm -hmm. who's familiar with that local market, and that's where they are. But credit unions will have a pretty broad base. Probably where we're weakest, I think, is just a straight ground-up construction with some capital limitations that we have and some of the timeframes on some of those projects. That's probably where I, I, if we had one area that I'd say we're weakest in, it will be just a straight ground up construction project. Yeah. But other than that, we'll take a pretty broad base of property types and structures, just like you said. Yeah. So really, it sounds like you're more of a relationship-based lender, really looking at the sponsor or the borrower, and probably more focused on productive assets rather than future productive assets. That makes sense. Ab- Absolutely. We want people, I, I want to know who's who we're working with and understanding their business, not just for this transaction, but really where they want to go. I don't know too many real estate investors who just get one loan and say, well, that's it, good. I think I'm good for my career. You Typically, you want to keep growing that and building, and that's where we want to help you. But we also want to understand your expertise and skills. Are you the person who's going to uh, more of that manager day to day? Are you the money person? Are you the person who can negotiate? Are you the person who's going to be out there fixing the toilets when you get a call from a tenant? We want to understand who you are and your skill sets and how you're going to have an all around team behind you. That makes a ton of sense. And uh, since you brought up that note on really getting to know who you're working with as the borrower, Let's get to know Mark as the lender here and as a person as we go into the quattro questions. What do you say? Awesome. Let's do it. All right, Mark. So first one, what is your superpower, life or business, and how does it serve you well? I love being able to adapt to the setting that I'm in. I always consider myself a little bit of a chameleon. Growing, I've worked with the elite of the elite. And I grew up in the coal region of Pennsylvania, where I can kick back with a yingling in the corner of a fire hall. So I like to make, think that I can make people feel comfortable with me on a wide variety of who you are, where a lot of people, they, they stick to their kind and that's about it. I have a pretty broad spectrum, people that I like to work with. I love that, Mark. Now let's flip the coin over. What is your biggest failure in life or business? And what did you learn from it? Oh, the one time when I was at my credit union, we had a deal that was, it was borderline 50-50. And somebody in our committee stood up and said, ah, we have a good portfolio. What's the worst that could happen if this goes bad? And the lesson that I learned in life was a bad deal. It's not about the money. It just sucks all the time and energy out of your business and operations. You can recover your money, 
but it's the bigger cost is all the time and energy that you spend dealing with something that you weren't quite sure about to begin with. That is an incredible way to voice. No deal is better than a bad deal, folks. And you're right. That that's I've had mostly good deals, fortunately, but I've had a couple of doozies where it's like, wow, I wish I never would have bought that thing. And it just takes more time than you ever could imagine. So, wow, thank you for sharing that. Let's jump over to question number three. So Quattro is all about philanthropy. It's one of our four pillars after all. And I love to give our guests an opportunity to share their philanthropic heart. So what gets you excited as far as giving of your time, talents, and treasures? And uh, you never know if we link it in the show notes, sometimes uh, we get reports of giving in that, in that capacity. Sure. I love a, a big initiative in our credit union space is financial education. It is undervalued in our education system. It's undervalued in high school. I have college kids and it's definitely undervalued there. And I love to help out with speaking engagements and working at our different, we call them our financial reality sections of working with kids and understanding finances. Uh, I think it's great. I, I, I can help them out a little bit and, and help them out with money and budgeting and things like that. That's incredible. And I couldn't agree more. It's something, it's not taught in school, unfortunately, and it's needed more than ever right now. So Mark, we're coming to the end of our time. What is the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you? Should they want to reach out and just say hello or talk about a product or a relationship with, with you and your cooperative? Sure. We have our company website, mbfs.org, but you also can connect with me on our personal branded website, markritter.com. M-A-R-K-R-I-T-T-E-R.com. I'm as active as anybody in the country on LinkedIn. So if you're a listener, let me know, connect with me. And I manage that personally and love to connect with people. And we help a lot of credit union members all over the country. And if you want to search for a credit union, we don't have somebody in your backyard. We'll search and we have relationships all over the country where we can connect you with somebody a credit union that's lending in your area for your type of loan. All right. Perfect, Mark. That will be in the show notes, folks, for your clicking pleasure as always. So scroll right down on whatever you're listening to this on. And Mark, thank you for joining us today, talking through the, the magic that is the credit union world. And I hope to have you on the show here again very soon. I'd love to help you out anytime I can on or off the air. This episode is brought to you by Agora's Investment Management Solution. Are you a GP or syndicator still using spreadsheets or an outdated investment management platform? Advance to Agora, the next step in investment management evolution. Agora's customers raise capital 40% faster and reduce operational expenses by 25%. With Agora, you can collect commitments faster, raise more capital by creating beautifully designed data rooms, public brochures, and automated subscription flows. Manage all your investor relationships efficiently with the most advanced investor CRM on the market. Delight your investors with a beautifully designed investor portal, which is fully customized to fit your brand and integrate seamlessly into your website. Distribute payments in a click directly from the platform and automatically generate and send all the reports and statements your investors need. Agora is suited for all types and all sizes of GPs or syndicators starting with an affordable $5.99 a month subscription plan. Click the link in the description to book a live demo and learn what Agora can do for your business. Agora, better investment management. All right, Real Estate Runway, I hope you enjoyed that show. We got to know Mark Ritter a little bit, his story, how credit unions have a place in the world today, how they're a little different from banks, which I tend to like the fact that a credit union can't quite lend out as much as a bank can. But I think the structures that are available there, you'll find very collaborative and more relationship focused. So give them a look, reach out to Mark Ritter at markritter.com. Scroll down in the show notes, it's right there. If you got any value out of the show or anything else Real Estate Runway puts out, do us a favor and pay it forward. Share it with somebody, two or three people you think would enjoy it, like it, subscribe to it, comment on it. Whatever, wherever you're listening to this, just interact with it because interaction is how we grow and reach more people like you. This has been another episode of the Real Estate Runway Podcast. Until next time, over and out. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway Podcast.